It's been about 20 years, about the time, or the same year at least, that my family moved to Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And there was an event that took place in 2008 that shook, literally shook, the city of Rio. A luxury apartment building, 22 stories tall, called the Palace 2, part of it collapsed, top to bottom, all 22 floors. One corner of that building just went to the ground suddenly and without warning, and eight people lost their lives. The building began, of course it was evacuated, but it began to lean to one side, so the city had to evacuate like 20 high-rise apartment buildings in that neighborhood so they could bring the rest of that building down. Of course, there was an investigation that followed. The whole city was worried. So many people live in those high-rise buildings in Rio, and they were thinking, is our building next? What happened? Long story short, (laughs) the engineer responsible for overseeing the construction of that building went to prison. They found that he had used beach sand in the construction of the building. He had mixed that with the concrete, creating a a very weak structure. It was bound to fall. And so he was sent to prison. It's not much of a stretch to jump from that to Matthew chapter 7. Jesus told a story about faulty construction materials. There were two men building homes. One of them chose to build on rock, solid rock. The other chose to cut some corners, chose to use cheaper materials, let's say, built his right on top of beach sand, a foundation of beach sand. And you all know this. Don't care where you live. Eventually, there's going to be some bad weather and some bad weather hit. The winds came as the storm rolled in and battered the two homes. Waters rose around those homes. One of them stood strong. One of them collapsed. Jesus said this as the conclusion of his story in Matthew chapter 7. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a man, a wise man, who built his house on the rock. Everyone who hears my words and obeys them is like a wise man building his house on a rock. A life built on the words of the Lord. That is a life engineered to hold up. That is a life built to last the whole way through and beyond. You see, every, every one of us, every single one of us is in the life construction business. Everyone in our neighborhood, everyone in our city, we are all building our lives. The materials that we use might be a little different from person to person, but everybody's building a life. So what are you building your life out of? What are the materials that you're leaning on to make your marriage strong, to make your finances strong, to make your relationship with God healthy and growing? What are those materials? Like that beautiful, luxurious, luxurious palace to apartment building, you can't always tell from the outside what someone's life is built out of, right? You know this. It may look strong, it may look successful, but it may be incredibly weak. And this morning, we're going to look at one factor, and Jesus says in Matthew 7, it is a key factor, and that is your relationship with the Word of God, with the voice of of God, more specifically, the Bible. The Bible is a key factor in building a life that, frankly, holds up, right? 
And I'm not going to try to convince you this morning that the Bible is the Word of God. Certainly that is an, a very open and dynamic debate that goes on. And there are lots of skeptics. I've talked about that plenty of times. But what I want to do in our time this morning is key in on the benefits of choosing to build your life out of that material, out of those bricks and mortar, the words of God. That's what we're going to do this morning. And the short answer as to why a 22-story apartment building collapsed was that the core material used was not pure. It was adulterated. It was, it was weakened by a mixture with this cheap substitute. The Bible is pure. The Bible is strong. Listen to what Psalm 12, 6 says, The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times, purified to perfection. You can build with this and know it's going to hold up. There are no weaknesses here. There is a potency to the Word of God, to the Scripture, and multitudes of people over the centuries can testify, as can I, many of us, the Word of God has transformed our lives, has been powerful in our lives. And one of the things, as you think about the Bible, that is so remarkable about it is the diverse reach of this book, how it's able to speak to so many people in so many different cultures, so many different languages. You will find the Bible in the hands of billionaires and beggars. You will find the Word of God in the hands of presidents and plumbers. You will find the Word of God all over the planet. It absolutely and indisputably has a one-of-a-kind reach, ability to speak to different kinds of people. For me, it's changed the way Gary was talking about earlier, it's, trained, it's changed the way I treat my neighbors. It's changed the way I treat those I love and those I, I really struggle to love. The Bible has changed the way I do my life as a husband, as a father. It's really just made me a better human being. And it, by the way, it's got a long ways to go. Work in progress here. But more than anything, the Bible has helped me come into a relationship with my best friend, with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's revealed to me what He did for me on the cross, how He has set me free to live life fully in the here and now and have a hope that extends beyond the grave. You see, the Bible, it is not just a book. We've talked about this before. Even the word itself means that it's more than a book. Bible comes from the Greek biblion, the word for library. It's a collection of 66 books. It is a library from God to us. And so whether you're holding a paper copy or you've got that smartphone in your hands this morning, you have access to a library engineered by God to help you build a life. It's amazing. It's one of the ways we know God loves us and cares for us, that He's equipped us in this way for anything that comes in life. The first thing I want to point out this morning, if you've got an outline, you can fill this out. The Bible is a bloom that never fades. It is a bloom that never fades. The message is timeless. History has proven time and time again that the Bible has a message that holds up. And it is more accessible today in 2019 than it has ever been. Isaiah put it this way. The grass withers, especially in a month or two here in Dallas, right? The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. You can test that one, by the way. Whatever your belief system, you can verify that statement through history. 
The Word of God never fades. In fact, it is blooming more than ever. It's more available now than ever, despite the fact that the Bible is the most reviled, the most banned, and the most burned book in history. Even today, it is the most banned book on planet Earth. But it thrives, and it grows. I read a story a while back. A North Korean uh, a guy just got released from prison in North Korea. He was serving a prison term for having a copy of the Bible. <laughs> Governments and powerful people over centuries and centuries have done everything they could to wipe the Bible out, to criminalize possession of the Bible. And despite that, despite that fact that it is the most attacked book in history, it is also the best seller in history. And its reach continues to expand. Practically, you can open your Bible and encounter the voice of God, the living voice of God. You can open your Bible and you can hear a word for your life that is just as timely and relevant today as 2,000 or 2,500 years ago when the pen was first put to the papyrus. It's just that kind of book. It's unique. And while the claim may seem dramatic, it's hard to argue against the historical fact the Bible has a timeless message. 1 Peter 1.25, Peter says, The word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is good news that was preached to you. So it is, it is a bloom that never fades. It is also a beacon that lights the way. The Bible is a beacon that lights the way. The message gives direction. I assume most of us have done some hiking at some point in our lives. I don't know that most of us have done nighttime hiking. It's a different kind of thing. I remember uh, my dad and I and a couple guys, we were going to try to summit one of the 14ers in Colorado, one of the tallest peaks in Colorado. And you needed to get there by mid-morning, get to the summit and start headed down because the thunderstorms would roll in. And so we had to get up at 2.30 in the morning to begin our ascent. You need a light at 2.30 in the morning up there in the mountains. Had flashlights, had little headlamps and because there are all kinds of places that you can step that are not safe places you could turn an ankle or you could fall off the side of the mountain you need a light so that you can see the way ahead and life is like that we make Hundreds, thousands of decisions a day. We're taking one step after the ev other every single day. And the habit of opening the Bible regularly, more specifically daily, of opening the Bible, of turning on that light, it is a huge help in showing both the the, the path that you need to stay on and the pitfalls you need to avoid. Psalm 119, 105, longest chapter in the Bible, which, by the way, is a chapter entirely about the Bible. Psalm 119. As David wrote, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Now, one of the mysteries when it comes to the Word of God, the Bible is a blade. <laughs> the Bible is a blade. The message cuts deep, right? Now, a blade can be painful, right? The cuts can be painful or scalpel in the hand of a capable surgeon can save a patient's life. The right incisions from the Word of God have life-saving benefit as well but know this it's not always comfortable allowing the bible to operate on your life right 
It's not always something that's going to put you at ease. In fact, your time in the Word of God and the Holy Spirit speaking to you through the Word of God may give you more than a few sleepless nights. I love this passage from Hebrews. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. There is no part of you the Word of God cannot reach and touch and change if you will open yourself up to it. And we all need an honest voice. We all need some true words to be spoken into our lives, sometimes some uncomfortable words to be spoken into our lives because we're all a little bit selfish from time to time. We all struggle with sin from time to time. We all need to rethink our priorities occasionally and think about how we invest our lives and invest even our money. And the Word of God, this two-edged sword, comes in. It opens it up, us up. It exposes our thoughts. It exposes our desires. It exposes the things that I'm doing that torpedo my relationships. It exposes the things I'm doing to put distance between me and God. Next. The Bible is a breath. I wonder how many breaths you've taken since I started preaching. Quite a few. The Bible is a breath. It's the breath of God, of your Creator. It's a message that gives life, breathes life into us. In the beginning, there was this dark void, this expanse of nothingness, and then what the scientists call the Big Bang, or theologians call the Genesis, this moment happened, and all of a sudden there was something, and that something came about because God spoke. The Word of God can bring something into existence that was not there before. When God speaks His breath, the source of all that is, it infuses life. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16 that when you open the Bible, you know that these words are what? They are God-breathed. God-breathed and useful and useful for your life. Quite frankly, it's a cause for for celebration. When you see someone who has received the Word, who is in contact with the Word, who is allowing God to breathe into their life every day, I promise you, if you find that person, you're going to get an opportunity to watch the Spirit of God work in that life, in every detail of that life. And it is a, it is a beautiful thing to see. And, and in fact... Paul celebrated that when he wrote to the, Corinthians, or the Thessalonians. He said in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, We thank God. We thank God constantly for this. For what? That when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as what it really is. The word of God, which is... I love this. It is at work in you, believers. The Word of God at work in you. What a wonderful thing. What a challenging thing. I want the Word of God to be at work in you. I pray for that. And one of the ways, in fact absolutely indispensable for this to happen is for you to listen to the Word of God or read the Word of God on a regular basis. 
Now back to what Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 7. The Word of God is also a building block. It is a support. Matthew 7, 24, we read this. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock again. You're going to face troubles. You might be facing them right now. A life that holds up is one that has a relationship with the word of God. Can withstand the storms. Finally, the, the Bible is bread. I love me some fresh baked bread. Doesn't much matter what kind. Can be a a croissant or a sandwich loaf or some of those Hawaiian rolls. The Bible is bread. The Bible strengthens us. We all face things that sap our strength. Amen? <laughs> Without a doubt. It may be that difficult person that you have to interact with at work or that difficult neighbor. It may be a difficult problem that you're facing right now. We've all got stuff that saps our strength. Money problems, relationship challenges, health struggles, you name it. And when you regularly feed on the bread that God has set before you, when you feed and nourish yourself with the Word of God, you get strong enough to handle whatever it is that life throws at you. Because you know, not even death can take you out. Jesus declared when he was being tempted, when he was being put through the meat grinder by Satan, he declared in Matthew 4, 4, responding to the enemy, he said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's my food that's my bread, Jesus declares. You weren't made simply to survive using the building materials you see around you. The food, the money, the stuff in the here and now. You have a soul. Better yet, you are a soul. And soul food is the Bible. Soul food is the Bible. The very words of your loving Heavenly Father, the one who, who sent His Son to die for you on the cross. His words are food for your life. And so this morning, this is a faith foundation morning. It is a time to kind of get back to our basics specifically. Between you and God, will you renew your commitment to hear and follow the Word of God? That's the question. All sorts of decisions you are about to make this week. Some of them quite small. Perhaps some of them quite large. You're going to decide a little bit later this morning what you are going to have for lunch today, okay? You're going to so decide tomorrow morning whether or not you're going to get up and go to work. You're going to decide which route to take home from church later today. You're going to decide uh, which show to binge watch on Netflix today. I don't know. But we're going to make decisions, all of us, big decisions and small decisions, but maybe the single biggest decision you will make this week in terms of how it will impact your life is this one. I'm calling it the disciples' commitment. The Word of God has the last word in my life. It has authority over my decision making and my doctrine. The Word of God has the last word over my decision making, over my doctrine. I'm going to build on that. That's my foundation. That's my rock. One more thing. There are just 
as we finish up this morning, there are a lot of tools out there to help you in your time with the Lord. I mean, we're constantly providing materials for you here at Preston Crest. Uh, version is that free app. Couldn't recommend it more. There are hundreds of tools of devotionals and studies that you can use there. There's a, a great book out there called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. I'd recommend that book as well. But the most important thing is that you simply make time to read the Word of God. And when I say read the Word of God, I don't just mean speed read it. I mean read it, chew it, digest it. Think about what God is saying to you. It's the most important thing you can do there. And one more thing. This is just kind of a tip. Remember, the Bible is a library, right? It's a library. You've got law books in this library. You've got history books in this library. You've got personal correspondence between individuals or between an individual and a church. You've got biographies in this. You've got history books in this you got poetry in this you got songs in this so what i'm saying is don't think you're going to read it all the same and i share this with you because it was one of the most transformative things i learned in my journey with christ there is a richness of the bible that is appreciated when you understand what kind of literature you're reading in the proverbs or the psalms or second samuel or the book of revelation it gets a lot less confusing A lot more interesting and a lot more helpful when you appreciate that. I put a link to a resource there. So here it is for tip for study and reading. A good Bible student appreciates the literary style of the text. The Bible contains poetry, prophecy, music, history, letters, biographies, genealogies, law books, parables, and proverbs, and other stuff too. It's a library, right? But it's all inspired by God. Doesn't mean it's all the same, but it's all inspired by God. Like if I'm reading poetry like the Psalms, I'm not trying to plow through as many of the Psalms as I possibly can. I'm trying to delight in the rhythm, in the meter. I'm trying to delight in the beauty of those words. If I'm, if I'm reading a, a, the Proverbs, I'm not trying to read 30 Proverbs. I'm trying to read one, maybe two, maybe three Proverbs because I need to hear that wisdom and I need to sit there and think and pray about okay, how does this apply to my life? Right? Anyway, just a tip for you to take home. Figure out what kind of lead, literature you're reading when you open your Bible. Usually not a hard thing to do. And then respect that style. Honor that style. It will help you get the most out of your time in God's Word. Spoiler alert this morning. We'll cut to the end of the story here. Uh, in the 66 books of the Bible, really they all have to do primarily with Jesus. From the book of Genesis, the Old Testament is pointing forward to Jesus. There are prophecies about Jesus in the very beginning. I would say even the very first verse of the Bible. He was there creating the world. So the book of the the Old Testament is pointing forward to Jesus. It wants the Jewish people to see Jesus. It wants all nations to encounter Jesus as the Messiah, the one sent from heaven to earth. The Gospels are pointing directly at Jesus. This is Him. This is what He did on Tuesday. This is the name of the person He healed, Bartimaeus. This is what happened when the Romans arrested him and put him on trial and put him on a cross. This is what happened three days later when he walked out of the tomb. And then the, 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 the book of Acts is talking about the history of the church, of Jesus' church. Most of the rest of the New Testament is going back to Jesus again and just explaining, unpacking, what does this mean for you? What does this mean for planet earth that God came, that he was incarnate among us and he lived among us and he gave himself for us? Paul and Peter, they're unpacking that. The book of Revelation is a unique book at the very end. It's pointing forward to eternity where there is an eternal celebration going on that we will join shortly with Jesus. 
If you want to give your life to Christ this morning, we would invite you to do that. Being baptized into Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, to receive the help of the Holy Spirit in your life. Maybe you just need prayers. Come pray with me or one of our shepherds or just pray, huddle up and pray with somebody around you about whatever it is, whatever storms are battering against your life today. God wants to hear your prayer. He wants to help. Let's respond as together we stand.